Hi and welcome to this session on decoding men's mental health with the Live Love Laugh Foundation. I'm Dr. Sham Bhatt, psychiatrist and physician and um, chairperson of the Live Love Laugh Foundation. And today we're going to talk about men's mental health, which is really a very important topic for many reasons, which we're going to discuss over the next 45 minutes. Thank you so much for joining, joining us today. Welcome to this live session. Let me just run you through what we have planned. Uh, I'm going to discuss men's mental health and share some facts with you, share some pointers on how we can help people who are going through distress and how if you're a man who's struggling with any mental health issues, how you can help yourself. I'm also going to be talking to a very special guest who is going to share his experience with some mental health challenges and how he overcame them. And I'm going to take your questions, any questions you have about mental health. So. Welcome again. I'm Dr. Sham Bhatt. This is the Live Love Love Foundation and we're talking about men's mental health. Now, you know, we don't, we can sometimes forget that men actually suffer quite tremendously from mental health issues. Are you surprised by that? Or is that something that is known to you? Because when I talk to people, some people assume that men, uh, you know, don't have as many emotional problems and that uh, depression is less often diagnosed in men. Now, that second part is true. Depression is diagnosed more commonly in women, twice as commonly in women compared to men. But the statistics tell us that men die by suicide two and a half times more than women do in our country and globally about three to four times compared to women. So there's a discordance in that statistics where the statistics are telling you that men suffer from depression less than women and yet they seem to, they, they do die by suicide much more commonly, two times, two and a half times more commonly than women. And there are many reasons for this. There are many reasons for why mental illness, depression, anxiety and emotional distress in men is often hidden and we don't realize that men are suffering. Now, I've been a psychiatrist for 20 years now, more than 20 years. Uh, and, you know, I, I've worked in the US for a while and in India now for more than 10 years. And I've observed that men from cultures across the world actually share certain ideas about what it means to be a man and certain ideas that men have learned about themselves, about how to handle emotions and feelings actually end up hurting them. Now, we often don't necessarily talk about depression in terms of gender, right? In terms of women's depression or men's depression. And if you open up the textbook of psychiatry and you look at the diagnostic criteria for depression, it is gender agnostic, which means we diagnose depression irrespective of, de of gender. We diagnose it with in the same way, looking at similar symptoms. But what we've found is that men don't necessarily show the same symptoms of depression as women. So the classic symptoms of depression are feeling low, feeling sad, feeling a loss of pleasure or interest in doing things, which we call anhedonia in psychiatry, this feeling that nothing is bringing you pleasure. And these symptoms combined with changes in appetite, changes uh, in sleep, focus, concentration, and self-esteem, right? These are the classic symptoms and signs of depression. But when a man gets depressed, often they don't talk about sadness. They are not even in touch with the fact that they're feeling sad. So rather than feeling sad or looking sad, a man may express his anguish in ways that are actually that are going to push people away. It's well known that when men are struggling emotionally, they act out. By act out, it means rather than talking about your feelings, you're behaving differently. And what are the ways in which men behave differently when they're going through anxiety, depression or stress? Well, one of the most common symptoms we see is actually anger and irritability. Men seem to get very angry and irritable when they are in pain. And then 
act out in different ways. A man may start actually working more, spending more time in office, doing more work as a way to get away from his feelings. And again, we don't usually associate increased functioning with depression, right? You know, you, when you think of depression, you think of someone who is not doing any work, who is, you know, just staying at home and um, no energy and so on. And of course that happens with depression, but for a great many men, they actually end up working much more or trying to distract themselves through other means. Work is of course one of the ways in which men can distract themselves from their own painful feelings. Now the other thing that happens to men when they suffer emotionally is that many of them uh, end up using substances like alcohol to dull the pain. Uh, men are far more likely to use substances to deal with mental health challenges like depression and anxiety than women, although both genders obviously are at increased risk for substance abuse when, when they're going through depression and anxiety. But men particularly uh, have a higher risk of that. And so typically a man may start avoiding his family, you know, working more or staying out of the house. They might start drinking more and that alcohol, while it eases the pain and the depression and anxiety in the short term, you know, for an hour or two, obviously it's very toxic to the brain and alcohol only ends up making depression and anxiety worse and alienating people around them. A man might also have a lot of physical symptoms, which is again common in both genders, but a little bit more common in people who are not in touch with their feelings. So whether it's a man or a woman, if we are not in touch with our feelings, we're going through anxiety, depression or stress, those, that stress or anxiety, it is manifested in the body, it's expressed in the body. So a, pers a man suffering from anxiety or depression might say they're not feeling sad, but they might complain of fatigue, feeling tired a lot, or abdominal pain, um, you know, chest pain, back pain is very common, and so on. So they can have physical symptoms without really being in touch with the emotional symptoms of depression or anxiety. So what we see with men is that as they start suffering from depression, because of the anger and irritability and the substance abuse, they're pushing people away. And they also seem to be less uh, connected with people. Women, one of the, I mean, if you have to make a generalization, obviously keep in mind there are many exceptions and what I'm saying about men may be applic applicable to many women and vice versa. Uh, so this is a generalization. But many times, you know, what we see is that women are good at forming connections. Women are good at what we call affiliation, which means they can seek support more effectively they are better at communicating their feelings, especially when they are vulnerable, and then they can get support from their friends and their family. A man, as I said, uh, is not uh, able to do that as much. He is not able to be vulnerable. He is not able to share his pain in a direct way, saying, "I'm hurting. I'm feeling bad." He's not able to cry, and so he does not. He can. He does not, of course, therefore lean on people, and he's also not able to have the same kinds of friendships that women have with other women. Men with other male friends, you know, tend to be like buddies, they hang out, they do activities together, but they don't necessarily talk and share their feelings. And so the man therefore feels more and more alone in their despair and distress, not knowing what they're feeling, not able to express it and acting out with alcohol, anger, sometimes even resulting in violence, road rage, that kind of thing. And so you can see what that would do to their relationships and how isolated a man would end up being. There can be other uh, symptoms and signs of depression. And I'm of course going to talk about a whole lot more. These were just some of the more common ways in which depression and anxiety is manifested in men, is felt in men and expressed in men. And you can see why if a person is not able to express, not able to seek support, not able to be vulnerable, they can end up uh, feeling really hopeless and helpless and that definitely is a factor in that statistic we are seeing that men actually die by suicide two and a half times more than women it is because of this issue now why is it happening you know there's a lot of debate about how much of it is nature versus nurture how much of it is the biology of being a man with the hormonal differences between men and women and how much of it is because of social conditioning the way society teaches men, rather boys, on how to be and how to manage their feelings. And 
my own opinion is that it's a mix of both. There are some biological differences in the way the brain is structured, in the way that men access their emotions versus women. Um, there's also a little more aggression because of testosterone. So there's definitely some biological differences, but there's undoubtedly social conditioning. We often tell boys, be a man, don't cry. Don't be a girl is something I've heard said to me when I was a boy. You know, if, I, if uh, any boy cried, that was the, the kind of thing that you heard. And so what society is doing is that it's shaming boys shaming them about their own vulnerabilities, about their own tears, about their own pain. And how does a boy cope with pain when the only instruction that he is getting is that, listen, it's shameful to cry, so man up and stop crying and be a man. Now you can imagine when you are told this, the only option you have is to basically numb yourself, to push the feelings away in the back of your mind, somewhere out of your conscious uh, mind, into your subconscious. That's the only way you're gonna deal with it because you've not understood your emotions. You've not had the space and time to talk about how you feel. You've not grown up in a society where society was saying it's okay for you as a boy and as a man to cry, to be vulnerable, to share your feelings. So undoubtedly there's been, you know, a lot of social stigmatization about normal human feelings when it comes to uh, boys and how they have grown up into men. And women who are watching, you know, I'm sure many of you are aware of sort of the structure of, I mean, men and women, both of you are aware of the structure of patriarchy. But I think what we want to be also cognizant of is that that structure, that patriarchal, classic, what we call toxic masculinity way of life does not just negatively affect women, it also negatively affects men. And what we need to see is a new way of being for men where they're able to be vulnerable, able to share their pain and able to seek help and support where it's necessary because we're losing too many people to this condition. More than 300 men die every day by suicide. And for every man who dies, every person who dies, there are thousands suffering silently. And suffering silently but perhaps many of them not suffering silently but then transmitting anger and pain not just within but to their family their loved ones and all around and that can create a lot of struggle and strife in families and, and domestic situations you know the tragedy is that many men who are angry who are behaving badly who are hurting other people are in fact men who are hurting deeply and who need to be healed. And that's, uh, and that's a fact. And I'm hoping that with greater awareness, like conversations like this, we have a society where this does not happen and that both men and women get the help and support they deserve. Thank you so much for joining in. I'm going to invite our very special guest now. Um, he is, in fact, a very uh, well-known musician. He is a sitar maestro. Uh, youngest and last disciple of um, Pandit Ravi Shankar and he is currently based in New York as well as in India. His name is Rishabh Sharma. Rishabh, welcome Hello, to this uh, Insta, Insta Live. Hi there. Oh, How are you, Rishabh? Congratulations Great on this first, uh, first ever Insta, uh, Instagram live session like this. I'm honored Thank to be you. a part of it. And it's, uh, it's great to have you, Rishabh. And uh, obviously, I think a lot of our viewers have heard of your work and, and uh, listened to you and so on. So thank you. It's a pleasure yes. to have you. Same here. Like so Rishabh, um, thank you so much for also for agreeing to share your story about your experience about, you know, with mental health challenges. And uh, thank you for sharing that because it'll really help other people to hear you and, you know, understand what you went through and how you sort of dealt with it. Can you share a little bit, Rishabh, about, you know, what you were going through and what the challenges were like for you? Yes, so I, I think uh, it started in in the end of 2020 when I lost my grandfather. He was uh, very close to me and almost like a third parent, you know, because often my parents would travel around the world, and right. we were we were left with our nana nani, and mm -hmm. I was um, I was very close to him more than my nani because you know it was a very fun person to be around you know we he was just like my best friend I could talk to him about anything and everything 
even like my girlfriends and everything so mm-hmm. it was like that sort of a relationship right. that i shared with him so uh, and he was my biggest fan you know any any assembly events at the school um any auditorium show that i'm playing so he would be the first person in the audience to any uh, to come and you know just just be there for me all the time so when when we lost him you know i uh, naturally in you know, a loss of life you know brings in uh, depression and um, it's just a matter of how you get out of it and i i took my sweet time <laughs> to come out of it and i think in march 2021 is is when you know then i it's i mean with everything that was going around during the pandemic right. you know every day we were losing someone or the other and you know things in delhi were so bad you know we lost so many lives not just uh, family but also like musicians uh, close musicians who uh, yeah. were very close to me and uh, uh, friends and you know friends fathers you know mothers you know mm-hmm. it was it was a very dark time that we were uh, there and you know right. that's when you know that was like the zenith of my anxiety and you know i won't come out of my room i would just eat in my room i'll bring food to my room and eat and you know just uh, never escape that that little bubble right. that i had made what were you feeling rishabh at that time when you started experiencing those you know what were you feeling what was it how did you know that it was something different from your so usual I, experience so i you know before the pandemic i was doing really well you know in terms of my career and like where i was performing i was performing for crowds of 65000 people and then yeah. cut to i was put in a room uh, just by myself playing right. for myself so there was like this um vacuum uh, this blanket of um, you know performance anxiety as well you know that i was like afraid to go out in the public uh, as well so mm-hmm. so that was happening like it was like when the pandemic started itself mm mm-hmm. after and and during this time i i was uh, noticing that my relationships mm. were getting affected like how mm. i talked to my mom how i talked to my father mm. uh, you know there was slight disrespect and you know I, and i would realize like after like a few minutes that you know i have spoken to her or him this way she was irritable my, you were getting more yes. irritable at that time more angry i was very irritated easily easily mm. triggered like any right. little thing would uh, trigger mm. me and um uh, yeah you know just uh, i wouldn't be uh, as communicative that i as i usually am and mm. yeah just angry all the time you know basically it was it was yeah like any little you thing know, would trigger me yeah R- rishab you know you've talked about a couple of very um, i think important points i just want to share that with the audience as well which is mm. a lot of uh, many cases if not most cases of depression and anxiety the first episode happens in the context of life stress it's very common that in the context of life stress people have an episode of depression and anxiety and so sometimes people can't differentiate between what is a normal response to that loss or to that life change and something that may require professional help so as in your case you know you had a loss of meaning something that you really connected with that gave you that is part of your a very important part of your identity obviously playing the sitar and performing in front yes, of the audience yes that's true right and so that was taken away from you and so that affected your mood and then of course the loss of your grandfather uh, you know mm. is a powerful thing and i and those combined with the covid pandemic and the stress of isolation uh, those are some of the stresses it sounds like you were you were facing and then you started feeling anxiety and anxiety yeah. i just want to tell the audience right anxiety is also we talk about depression in men but anxiety is also very common both in men and women and when you put anxiety and depression together about 1 in 7 to 1 in 5 men will actually experience that sometime in their lifetime so it's actually pretty common and anxiety is you had symptoms of not wanting to go out feeling worried about going out irritability what else yeah. did you have any uh, sleep See, problems yeah as, as you or... mentioned um, also that i that sitar is my life and i was mm-hmm. um you know giving that up because i was feeling a certain way was is a big deal for me and you know yeah, sitar has always been my happy, happy place it has been my like coping mechanism for a lot of things. yeah any bad day i school i would come home and practice for hours and i'll feel like okay i can conquer mm-hmm. the world now so mm-hmm. so that was like the biggest thing that i wasn't practicing enough you know also i was thinking uh, my nanu he was my biggest fan mm-hmm. and you know during the end of his life i used to get on video call and just play for him you know that was mm. like the idea of sitar for mental health that that was originated from mm. like these sessions so mm. i was like who do i play for like you know my biggest fan is not here 
and yeah. you know who 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 wants to hear me so yeah. that that thing was also going in my head mm. as of sleep you know i i would often wake up like with my heart almost like beating out of my chest so your heart and, would be pounding you could feel your yeah heart. like in middle of the night mm. and right, uh, right. like restlessness you know sweating right and and these, so, these things were very common around that time rishab uh, those symptoms you know um basically as you know in a, what is anxiety let's talk a little bit about that mm-hmm. and we what is anxiety anxiety what we call an anxiety disorder is basically yeah. when there's a fight or flight response in the brain which normally mm-hmm. happens when we have acute threat so normally when we are attacked we get this fight or flight response but in an anxiety disorder the brain just generates that fight or flight response continuously and chronically and so you know fight or flight means heart pumping faster sweating muscles getting tense mm. can't sleep lots of negative thoughts irritability and anger and one that's a very common symptom when people are suffering from anxiety to wake up mm. with that palpitation sweating heart beating and it's obviously a very scary kind of experience to have right mm. yep absolutely and so i'm i'm you... also yeah i go for it sorry no no please 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 go no no please go no no i was i was just talking about you know how i sort of um got out of it was yeah. um first of all i think that's the same question you were sort of asking me exactly yeah um the uh, first of all you know your support system my support system was very strong at that time um you know the friends i used to hang out with even the friends i didn't follow up with you know were following up because just it was just the time that uh, we were going through so you know everyone just came together like that and also like on clubhouse um, it was a very very intimate platform where you know you can talk to each other it's like real voice it's not just like texting so i mean that's that's also where the tap mental health started but that's where you know our friend i i would i would get all my friends in the room and you know talk about uh, you know whatever is we are all are going through so i told them you know this, all of this is happening to me you know what should i do so mm. they suggested that you know i reach out for help you know yeah. clearly i'm not doing well mentally so mm. uh, that's when i tried looking out you know for uh, therapists and you know just try to seek therapy but mm. you know just the uh the system in america is so so annoying you know it's like you have to go through your physician that physician recommends i mean uh, gives a referral to your therapist and then you can go for therapy that's right that's right so it was it was a very um it's a very complex system and it has just made it very uh yeah. expensive and if you get out of, of the system it's very expensive and as a yeah. student i didn't have money so right. and even i found uh, even if i found it some therapists they had a waiting of two months to accept yeah. any new clients right so it was very tough you know we were just like stuck in this situation so i um i figured out a like, little loophole that you know if i see a psychiatrist i don't need a referral to that i could just straight up go to them and mm-hmm. uh, so i did that it was a very um, uh, uh, nice indian doctor you know he mm-hmm. was from he's from hyderabad or something <clears throat> most of the nice so, doctors are from india actually <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, i can watch for that uh, so he was very kind uh, he heard me out and you know at the end of the session he said rishav you know that i'm a psychiatrist right you know i, I don't uh, usually do talk therapy because I, my main job is to prescribe medication so you know that's un- that's actually you know i'm that is one of the confusions now i think for a lot of people actually therapy is a yeah. function which means hmm. a therapist is one who does therapy and hmm. a psychologist could do therapy or a psychiatrist you know traditionally would do therapy but i yeah. you're right what's happened in the last many years that a lot of psychiatrists now look at the hmm. biological side which is the brain and yep. you know less and less uh sort of have the time because of the pressures there so few psychiatrists they're spending yeah. less and less time doing talk therapy rishab i'm glad you sought help but tell me just to back up because what you did in terms of uh seeking help itself and you know even before you faced the challenges of not getting the therapist a lot mm. of men they have reservations about even beginning the process about actually going mm. saying look i have an issue i need to talk to someone what we find mm. is that men as i was saying even the idea that i am feeling something that's outside my control makes a lot of men uncomfortable right mm-hmm. and so they often will say no i i can deal with it myself and you know i'll find i'll have a good time and forget about this so what gave you what was you no know, how did you did you have any such um 
re- reservations or um, I guess what makes you different from a lot of men who would find it hard to seek help? Of course, I was, I was, uh, now that I think about it, that I have felt this way before in my mm. life as I was younger, you know, it wasn't something that just happened recently. Mm. It's just like, you know, I, there was not enough awareness and I didn't know like what this was, you know, why, why I'm, uh, I'm feeling this way. So mm. it was only because my friends shared, you know, their experiences and um, I had a good support system that, you know, that sort of identified this, uh, you know, that, that was happening to me. So I sort of owe them that, you know, that sort of brought awareness. And now I feel that responsibility with Satafi Mental Health that I also, you know, passed down this sort of uh, awareness. And right. uh, what my friends did for me, I want to do for other people. Amazing. And, Amazing. And I, I still remember like when I was going for... Um, just going to see the psychiatrist I just lied to Mm. my mom because I know my mom would just be like you know just it's nothing just wake Mm. up early wake up Mm. go to bed early you'll be fine Mm. Um, so it's it's still very stigmatized you know because their their parents also stigmatized it you know mental health was never looked at like a a, a real issue or Mm. uh, it's just like either you're crazy or you're normal so there's, there's you know you're right We, we don't have a nuanced understanding like in physical health for example everybody yeah. goes to the gym not because mm-hmm. they have a problem they want to get stronger and yes. therapy is not just about fixing us it's also about discovering who we are and really understanding ourselves in a deeper way right i mean i'm sure you had some of that experience mm-hmm. in therapy <laughs> exactly so so that was uh, i mean i still my my parents aren't like uh that comfortable yeah my like me sharing my story but i still share my story really about you know yeah yeah it's just still like you know it's, it's done now so move on i was like no i have to share the story to you know no it's very brave people. of you yeah yeah, yeah. we need so, more men uh, to speak up Rishabh. i'm glad yeah, you're sharing yeah. your story exactly so that was that was the uh, like the little struggle internal fight also that you know okay Let's do this. Let's let's today. Today is the day. And I was like postponing that day a little bit. Like, okay, mm. jayenge, jayenge. Um, Tell me, but... that's something, uh, Rishabh, just sorry, I just wanted to understand that because again, yes. a very important point. I think a lot of people watching, either them mm. or someone they love probably goes through this. The problem, the issue with mental health, right? Unlike say, if I get a fever, every day I have fever, yeah. usually. But with mm. if you have anxiety or depression, some hours are better. Some days are better. And so what people do is they say, okay, today I'm fine. Achha, you know, I'll postpone it till tomorrow. Then tomorrow mm-hmm. they feel a bit bad and again, a little better, you know, so there's this up down thing, which happens for a mm-hmm. lot of people and they keep pushing uh, the, the uh, visit to the mental health professional. They push it and push it. You know, what's the average length of time between a person having a symptom and seeing a mental health professional? What's what, uh, I, I we don't yeah. know for sure, but some it's three to five years. Wow! And and most people even today will not seek wow. help, mm-hmm. meaning that of the five to ten percent of people who are getting help, they are waiting a long time. Mm-hmm. And in that time, a lot of pain has happened, you know. And we've lost some yeah. people because of this. I mean, so uh, you know, I, it's a serious issue, but one that can certainly be helped if you if you seek help and if you get support. Yes. And I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I made that visit because, you know, that gave right. me a lot of clarity. Um, first of all, that it was an Indian doctor. So obviously, and that's something I like about in, you. Also, in the US. That you, mm-hmm. Yes, yes. In the US. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and within my neighborhood, he was like uh, five minutes away. So, yeah, what I was saying was I, one thing that I also like about you that you also go for like holistic methods, not just... Um, you know, the, the Western methods, you know, there, there are yeah. Eastern methods also like meditation and Ayurvedic. Sure. And so he was very open to that as well. And he was like, you know, yeah. you should meditate, you should yeah. um, go back to playing sitar and, you know, you should pr- continue your practice, just get into your regular routine, see how you feel. Right. And then right. he gave me a, a bunch of referrals to other therapists. So, and you know, that was just like talking and, you know, uh, letting it out, just letting yourself be vulnerable was, was, uh, was, it did wonders. You know, I, that yeah. day I, I still remember the feeling that I got when I, uh, you know, go walked out of the office. When you shared it for the first time in a lot. Yes. Ever, right? Yeah. 
Yep. I yep. see that a lot in my practice, you know, when men will come and, um, and the kind of vulnerability that they share in therapy where they may cry, mm-hmm. they're really sharing. I mean, they, I also mm-hmm. see two things, by the way, you know, I, I would often see men very good at masking their uh, depression or anxiety. You, they're going out with their buddies, having a few drinks. You can't even tell that this person is going through depression. But then they come. Oh, I'm a pro at that. <laughs> you're a pro at that. <laughs> you know, I, I feel I feel like guys are very good at that, and particularly in our country, I feel yeah. guys are very you know very stoic. Like we're going to shoulder that burden. We're going to do it. You know, let's be tough yeah. and yeah, sab theek ho jayega. You know, have a few, you know all that kind of bravado. Mm. And that's fine to have that faith, but you, but being strong and vulnerable are not mutually exclusive. In fact, being vulnerable is a sign of strength. It's not strong mm. to say I'm not hurting and I'm, I, I don't cry, right? It's a sign of strength that mm. I can say that I am crying or I'm hurting and I, I need help. And so I think you, like for and example, I'll you're, that. I'll fix yeah. that, exactly. Mm. And I really think that's amazing, Rishabh, because that's the real kind of masculine strength that needs to be modeled more and more like yourself, where, you know, you had no hesitation in, like you got help, you're talking about it, you're sharing it. Uh, and you're a role model for so many people. So that is, um, that's amazing to, to see. Hmm. Um, you know, Carl Jung talked about um, hmm. every person having masculine and feminine energies, right? Yeah. And yeah. for being a whole person, we need a balance between the masculine and the feminine energy within us. And for too long, okay. men have had this toxicity where there's too much emphasis on one side, the so-called masculine aspect, which is assertion, aggression, com- competition, success, all of that. And mm-hmm. the feminine, so-called feminine part, which is empathy, getting in touch with our feelings, um, connecting with people, having more room for patience and love, not necessarily competing all the time, not necessarily having to dominate all the time. You know, mm-hmm. that stuff is going to rescue uh, us as men as we start mm-hmm. becoming more and more whole and more complete when we yeah. balance our male and female energies in a way. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's, that's fantastic. Rishabh, I'm going to just pause and take a few questions. Um, yeah, And absolutely. then I'll come back to you. Uh, hang on, all right? So we're getting a lot of questions, some of which you touched on. So that's why I want to, I want to talk about it. Um, mm-hmm. Some of these questions came in earlier, which was collated by the team. And we're getting some questions right now. A very common question I've got is how to convince a man to go to a, for a consultation to a psychiatrist or to go for therapy. How do you take them in confidence in a way that they feel heard? How to provide an environment so that men can share their feelings? So a lot of variations of these questions. I'm going to share some some tips with you, uh, all of you watching. Just to reiterate what I said, remember that what you want to be, if you are, if you care about somebody, and there's a man, uh, you know, a male figure in, in your life, uh, brother, father, uh, husband, uh, boyfriend, partner, whatever it might be. These are some of the things to look for. And men, if you're, if you're going through the, these symptoms, uh, please pay attention to this. Remember that anger, irritability, substance abuse, um, changes in sleep, withdrawing from people, withdrawing from activities that they would normally do, or doing much more of an activity in an imbalanced way, all of these could be signs of uh, depression in, in a man. And if you see that, then it's important to start uh, talking to them about what to do. So the first point, if you want to help uh, a man, is actually to find the right place and time to have that conversation. That's very important. Mm-hmm. Men usually don't do well if you suddenly come to a guy and say, hey, listen, I, I have some concerns. Let's talk about your feelings. You know, As soon as you say, let's talk about your feelings, a lot of guys back off. Rather, mm-hmm. if you're going for a walk, if you're maybe playing a game together, you know, you're going out for a coffee together, Something where there's an activity in that space because there the man doesn't feel kind of confronted. You know, you're mm-hmm. sitting across the room, eye contact saying, how are you feeling? A lot of guys just back off from that. But if you go mm-hmm. for a drive, you go for a, you know, a coffee, then you can sort of gently bring the conversation up. And what you want to do is really, instead of talking about feelings initially, what you can do is share observations about what you have noticed in them. For example, you can say, you know, um, I noticed that you seem more tired recently, or I've noticed that you've been more angry or irritable recently. Yeah. How are you feeling? What do you, you know, and then you can follow it up with what are you feeling? So rather than straight up asking about the feelings, it's good to give some observations 
about things that will not make them feel defensive. Now, the other thing that you can do is instead of asking about feelings to ask them about meaning. Meaning is something that is a big part of all of this, even for you, Rishabh. And the meaning, so rather than saying, Rishabh, at that point, suppose I'd said, I mean, you are more open, but let's say I'd ask you, you know, Rishabh, how are you feeling? That's one way. Another way I could have asked you, Rishabh, you know, the sitar that you can't play now in public, you can't do your concerts. What does that mean for you, to you? What does it mean to you that that's happening? What does it mean to you that your grandfather passed away? You know, what does that mean to you? And that's when you would share. Like, it means to me that, you yeah. know, I feel alone. I, I feel like I don't have my meaning. I feel like, I don't have an audience. I feel, you know, something, right? You would start talking about that. Mm. So the question about meaning is a much more important, uh, rather effective question than directly asking about mm. feelings. The other thing is to actually ask more than once. You know, we actually had a campaign in uh, the Live Love Love uh, Foundation. I don't know if you saw that a few years ago. It was called Dubara Pucho. Mm. Uh, so we had a campaign yeah, about, uh, yeah. so we had this whole campaign. The idea was that if you ask someone, how are you, kaise ho? And they say, no, I'm fine. You ask again. Because many mm. people in the first time say, no, I'm fine, right? So you say, mm. you know, I hear you, but really, how are you? I feel, I'm, I care about you and I feel like you may be hurting. How are you feeling? Mm. That question to say, I care for you, I'm here for you. And I, asking not in a, you know, the way you phrase it with, the, with, with your heart and authenticity, that can really help a person open up. And then I would say, um, also make sure you're the right person to talk to the person, to the, to the, to, to this yeah. person. You know, sometimes you may be the right person. Sometimes yeah. you need to get this friend involved, the buddy involved, mm -hmm. right? Someone else you can trust because you may not be the right person, even though you care for them and they love you, they may still not open mm -hmm. up uh, uh, to you. That's and then, yeah. um, and then I think um, finally, I would say, listen. Sometimes we ask, but we don't listen. We are all too quick to give solutions like, you know, ye karo, wo karo, get up, go, you know, do exercise, think positive. People say these things. They say it because they, want, they care for us, uh, for men, and they, you know, or pe men, you know they care for the person and they, they want to help them. But yeah. what we really need to do once you ask that question is listen. Listen with full attention, full presence, not trying to solve the problem, not trying to give you instructions, just listen. That space where you don't judge a person, you're just listening, is a very powerful space that we can all create for our loved ones, men or women. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's very powerful. So these are some of the ways in which you can help uh, someone struggling with mental health issues to get them to open up. Once they open up, yeah. you can say, listen, you know, uh, you can share an experience of someone else who went to therapy. That's why conversations yeah. like ours, what you're sharing is so powerful, Rishabh. Yeah. Tomorrow there'll be a man suffering so uh, somewhere in silence and then his friend or partner may say, look, I want to show you what Rishabh mm -hmm. uh, went through. He's a young guy. He's successful. He has everything. And he went through something, not because he's weak, but because it happens to men and women. It happens yeah. to human beings. And there's no, yeah. uh, no harm in seeking help. And that's how powerful these conversations are. Uh, because I can talk about it as much as I like as a psychiatrist, as a therapist. But <laughs> coming from you who's gone through it, from the, mm -hmm. you know, as a someone who's experienced it and people, yeah. you know, in that sense relate to that. That's really good. Bishop, um, turning to other aspects, because one of the other questions I've got a lot about, and I wanted to ask you also about it. Um, yeah. The question I'm just going to read off here is about relationships. Uh, yeah. What happens in intimate uh, romantic and other intimate relationships when people, when men go through uh, depression and what's the connection between relationships and mental health for men? See, um, me personally, whenever I'm like anxious about something, I hmm. they do get affected. I mean, as simple as that. I, yeah. you know, I sometimes distance myself. I sometimes cut the hand that's trying to help me. I talk to my parents very disrespectfully, and uh, then I immediately realize, you know, what have I done? Hmm. Um, so all these things do happen, you know, in terms of my immediate relationships, you know, if like there's someone that's distant, you know, I won't, they won't be affected as much because they're just like not in the picture, but it's just like, uh, the people close to me that they get the face of it. Mm. And that's another question I wanted to ask you also, like, you know, 
when you're anxious when you're dealing with anxiety hmm so can we and if we can like what are the methods to sort of like cope with these and not um you know jeopardize your relationships and you know just um, sure. like your social circle yeah. Richard, let's yeah, let's talk about this because I'm getting a lot of questions also about this. I think, firstly, you know what we see is that men, one of the, um, so when men go through stress, anxiety, or depression, the mm-hmm. issues that affect them, the issues that cause that problem, are work, health, finances, relationships. Those are the categories that major affect stresses. people. Major stresses. work particularly for men although in in the past now men and women equally that work has become an important part of people's identity and therefore if anything affects your work it affects your sense of self it can cause depression relationships also are an important part of our identity right your identity uh, if you are in a relationship that's an important part of your life and your identity yeah. and therefore breakups also often can result in depression and anxiety for both men and women but research tells us that men are little more prone to experiencing mental health and physical health illnesses after breakups they're more vulnerable for the reasons that i was talking mm. about earlier that men tend to be more isolated mm. they don't often have close friends who you can share your feelings with i do you i don't know if things are, you know uh, not everyone's the same do you have buddies you can sort of share your you could share your vulnerabilities with what you are feeling and I have uh, women friends yeah that I can share okay. with okay there you go yeah because they they're more they also give That's me right. the yeah like the story from the other side you know mm-hmm. from the other gender mm-hmm. and also I feel like at least like my friends are more sensitive uh, mm-hmm. you know and they are very good listeners whoever we have are they all and, creative but I do have uh, Are they, they creative are creative people? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. So that, yeah, there you that's go. why that's why it's easier for them mm-hmm. to understand what it, what it is to be, uh, be an artist and and just not like a have a nine to five job. Mm-hmm. So not that I. I'm Good. Kidding. I'm glad to hear. But like they are more sensitive towards you know I'm, they know I'm me and that. they know the life and. Uh, Yeah, and they just are very good at listening. So I'm, I'm very grateful for my support system. That so I point of right a, point of everybody, uh, men especially, because traditionally men have not been good at having friends with whom they can share feelings. And you know, yeah. I think that's changing, of course, to some extent. And it's an important reminder to cultivate those kinds of relationships to be open mm. uh, to that. Now, in terms of the relationship and how it's impacted, you know, as you said, and a lot of people experience. anger will alienate the the partner or people around the person suffering and that's why awareness is so important where the man can get in touch with the fact that they are not really angry but they are in pain and that anger is an expression of hurt um if somebody as we said you know if somebody can gently talk to the person get them to open up they will often realize that what they are suffering they are hurting and that's why they are angry the man who's angry is not a bad person it's it's a person who, a person who's in pain and uh, of course having said that relationships often will suffer and many relationships actually unfortunately end as a result of one of uh, the the person's exactly. depression and anxiety yeah it happens and that only compounds the problem so which yeah. is why we want early intervention you know seeking support getting ther- therapy if that is required whatever you need to do you need to do it because the fact is you might be able to tolerate what you're feeling but it is affecting you your mind and body and it's affecting your relationships and you know people around you so um it's a it can be a challenge if the depression goes untreated and the person is not aware of of the pain so behind so i them. like if i am going through something so how do i control those um that anger Like what would be like? Is good. there any coping mechanism? Uh, yeah. Yes, or absolutely. Richard, uh, great question. I'm going to take all the other questions which are related to this. Which is, somebody asked me, can anxiety and depression get cured without medications or therapy? And there are things that you can do. We can do ourselves to help improve our mental health. Okay. Yeah. Uh, these are things you might have heard of, but I'm going to reiterate that because they're evidence-based, proven by science to help with depression and anxiety, for especially for prevention. and also yeah. for the treatment of mild depression and mild anxiety what are these things mm-hmm. number one exercise physical exercise is actually very important if any form of exercise is good 
I actually recommend for people who have not been exercising just to start with brisk walking five times mm-hmm. a week, 30 minutes a day. If you are inclined towards the okay with yoga, I actually recommend doing yoga as well because mm-hmm. yoga has some special benefits in terms of mental health as a form of exercise. So that's number one. The second thing is to have a regular sleep-wake cycle. Mm. Many people are going through sleep deprivation. You know, it's something that I think we all fight in the modern world, right? Where we try to get stuff well. late into the night. <laughs> there you go, you know. But international honestly, travel. international yeah. travel and jet lag and all of that, right? Yeah. yeah but true. Rishabh, you know, uh, having a regular sleep-wake cycle, mm-hmm. as they said, early to bed, early to, to rise, yeah, is right. actually uh, a very it's good... True. Very good advice. The third Mm. thing is nutrition. Having healthy, Mm. balanced nutrition where you avoid sugars, Mm. you avoid processed carbohydrates, you eat plenty Mm. of fruits and vegetables and you eat home-cooked food as much as possible, right? Try to avoid those food delivery apps which have become all too common. Um, And (laughs) that's really, by the way, a huge thing in mental health. We can talk uh, hours about nutrition and mental health because, yeah, there's the microbiome, which is the gut, your bacteria in the gut. And those bacteria actually synthesize certain neurotransmitters that are responsible for brain health. And so feeding the bacteria with good nutrition is actually important. So that's important. Yeah. The next food for mental avoid, health. Food for mental health. Food <laughs> My next heart. initiative. <laughs> <laughs> food and sitar is a great combination. Uh, yeah. it, it, both very healing. Um, the next would be to avoid substances to, you know, as a form of coping. It's okay if Numbing. you're having Numbing a social a drink, right? I mean, if you're going out socially mm. and you're not excessively drinking, having a couple of drinks, that's once in a while, mm. that's fine. But be careful mm. because many people can start using alcohol to numb themselves. And as I said earlier, that's only going to worsen the depression and anxiety. Yeah. The next is to learn meditation. Meditation very important. Very useful as a prevention. Also for anxiety, it's excellent. And uh, it's really good for mental health to meditate. And, you know, I, I feel like for you, playing sitar itself is a meditation. Yes. It must but on, on the side, I also uh, practice meditation now. It must be. Yeah. And it has um, helped a lot. I can, I can definitely vouch for that. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan and proponent of meditation. It's a powerful, mm. you know... Uh, Eastern for Indian cultural and ancient kind of tool that is very, very powerful. Um, And then having said, so these are the main uh, things. And okay, in addition, I would say having good relationships in your life, good friendships, people who are supportive, who are not toxic, but you know, really caring, you're not getting Mm. into competition, comparisons with them. You can be yourself. You can share your thoughts. You know, you can really trust them. You need, we need that. And you know, Actually, I also I can, have hmm. I, I have had people in in my life that you know their sort of way. I mean, also they they don't have any idea like how to comfort a person. You know, everyone hmm. doesn't know like what's the right way to comfort a person. Hmm. But you know, often there are people come, uh, uh, and it has happened multiple times that you know that I have gotten gone through something worse. Hmm. So don't feel this way. Yeah. 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 So unfortunately it happened to my like loss, loss of death, but they're like, they're like, okay, I have lost this and this. <laughs> so that doesn't make it better. Like how I'm feeling right now. So True. also, also I think these, these values can be treated in schools also. It's just like when they're young or by the parents, you know, so just so how to comfort someone and sort of, uh, I mean, you're the, you're the expert, you, you must know, but better, but you no, know, 100%, that, uh, it's not a good feeling. It's not, um, yeah. It's not. And I think we have, you know, in trying to support people, many people say the wrong thing. And, you know, we have to realize that nobody's pain can be minimized by pointing out a larger pain. You know, if I have lost my foot, I'm not going to feel better if someone's lost two feet, you know, in a way. (laughs) um, So to be honest, it doesn't help, although the the intentions are right. Obviously, it it makes people, obviously, if you're suffering, it makes you angry or irritated sometimes when someone Mm. says that. Oh yeah, uh, definitely yeah, right. angry. <laughs> and yeah, it was yeah. like someone I was like romantically involved in, so it was like even, oh, even worse. See. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, um, so I mean, th- these are the little things. But I also yeah. wanted to ask you about uh, uh, other coping mechanisms like music. Like, yeah. 
is there is there enough study that uh, says like yeah music can sort of uh, because that's a, a study that i would like to do you know the effect of sitar on the mind yeah so there are so is there any studies there are some preliminary studies which indicate that music mm-hmm. can be can obviously we all know i mean everyone who mm-hmm. loves music knows that music yeah. affects mood there's no doubt about that uh, and so right. for uh, to change to help with stress to help with mild anxiety to help you in a different state of mind different kinds of music actually can help there is some research mm-hmm. being done into special kinds of frequencies that can uh, you know help with with the mind and with mental yeah. health um mm-hmm. help heal and of course i think there's another level of healing that emerges with, like a person like you who's playing music because mm-hmm. playing music is not just therapeutic because of the music it's also very therapeutic because of the engagement with music because you when mm-hmm. you play music for you uh, one it's a, as you said earlier it's meaning it's a very powerful yeah. uh, meaning and identity but expression. it's also yeah. it's a form of expression it's a form of identity and it's also a place where you're in flow flow means mm-hmm. you've forgotten i'm sure i've uh, you know you've forgotten everything you've forgotten yeah. time place even you 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 just are one with the music your fingers are flowing yep. you're not even thinking about it right you don't even mm-hmm. exist there's only the music at that time there's no music yeah. and that is full flow it is actually meditation is very healing very powerful for the brain so you know when mm-hmm. you play music there are our person mm-hmm. plays music with that kind of uh, sort of passion mm-hmm. awareness yes someone said focused intent. awareness intent purpose yeah. meaning very very therapeutic but for people who are suffering from clinical depression and anxiety which is more than mild which is moderate mm-hmm. and severe then all of these things we have talked about can help but sometimes you need more and that's something i want to stress you know that no case is dif- is the same everyone is different mm. to that end and mm. we should not have a one size fits all kind of approach here yeah sometimes there are cases in the more uh, you know not mild but moderate to severe cases where medicines are also important and uh, very helpful in the treatment of depression and anxiety i know that mm. for many people that's a bit of a controversial subject uh, and yeah. i think we need a whole hour to uh, stigmatizing thing but mm-hmm. i want to tell you you know everyone listening that we have to accept that we have a brain and that this brain is not entirely under our control if it was mm-hmm. under your control i could, you would say i could tell you right now lower your blood pressure <laughs> change your blood sugar right that's your brain is controlling mm-hmm. it why can't you do it can you change your blood yeah. pressure right now can you change your blood sugar right now mm-hmm. you can't why not mm-hmm. because those are being mo- uh, monitored and um the signals are coming from parts of the brain where you don't have conscious access to now mm-hmm. those same parts of the brain change their functioning resulting in depression mm-hmm. and anxiety and while all of the things we talked about help many cases without the need for medicines as you said i'm not a guy who just says you got to take medicine and prescribe medicine i'm <laughs> absolutely believe we need to do what is right and bring everything together yeah. but i do want to tell people who are struggling that if your case that a good doctor says to you you know you've done therapy you've done everything else you're still struggling don't be stigmatized about taking a medicine Medication. for a while yeah. if it is required you know we shouldn't yeah. be stigmatized about treatment uh, we shouldn't there should be no stigma about any form of treatment at the same yeah. time we don't want a culture where we're just prescribing medicines like america where we they're yeah. not doing you know i worked 10 years there as you know rishab as a psychiatrist and i can tell oh, you really well I was in Illinois in Springfield Illinois for Illinois, 10 years okay. that's yeah so I did my residency okay. there and then I worked there for 10 years Beautiful. and I can tell you I I saw that while it was so developed in terms of brain science it really mm. did not have good integration of all the things we've talked about today and mm. that is something I'd like to see for our country we would not want our country just you know uh taking pills mm. we don't want our country either where people are suffering and dying because they're not taking medicine when required we want a country right. where we are leveraging our own wisdom our own expertise our sense of community and you know doing all of the things required for mental health and we have a society where men are much more open about talking about their feelings in the way that we have talked about today that's what we'd love to see for for our country right that would make such a difference so like before going to medicine it's it's uh it's important to give a fair shot to all these other uh, you know methods and also mm-hmm. holistic practices right you you mentioned yoga meditation yes. and also 
So are yes. there any Ayurvedic medicines that sort of help with mental health? Well, you know, there are many Ayurvedic practices that help with mental health. Um, mm. Because Ayurveda, the way Ayurveda looks at mental health is very holistic. Uh, mm. There are many strengths to the Western approach, which is very, very reductionistic, which means Western science breaks things down. It says, okay, what's yeah. happening at a genetic level, at a cellular level, at a neuronal level, you know, yeah. it sort of goes deeper and deeper into uh, a smaller and smaller sort of aspects. If you look at yeah. holism, it's to zoom out and say, in this individual, hmm. what's going on? So what I find with integration is you want to think about it both from all these aspects. So Ayurveda aspect, looks at yeah. anxiety, for example, as a condition where they talk about it in terms of a dosha imbalance, where there's mm. a vata imbalance is what they call it, which is the element of air. And it's interesting because in Ayurvedic literature, they describe anxiety holistically, not mm. just talking about mental symptoms. They'll say that your pulse is thready. You tend to uh, have dry skin. You tend to mm. not put on weight. You tend to uh, get angry easily. You know, so there's this sort mm. of holistic description, which is very interesting from Ayurveda. And in the treatments, they also look at nutrition, which we know is useful, certain body work techniques that are useful, et cetera, and certain supplementary or rather Ayurvedic uh, herbs that can be useful. But, you know, we are, we still don't have enough data. And, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, so we are trying to, obviously that's sort of science is moving in that direction. And uh, we also have the wisdom of the ages and the idea is to integrate it best as possible. Yeah. So I would say not an either or approach. approach. It depends on the yeah. case, depends on the situation and seek help, seek support. And uh, this is something that can be resolved and you don't have to hurt. You don't have to suffer in silence or at all, right? And that's the good news that this thing can be, this can be fixed. Whatever you're suffering from can be healed. And in fact, in the process of healing, you discover greater strength, greater empathy, wisdom and resilience. Would you say that's been true for you in your Absolutely, experience. you know, definitely talking about it um, helped a lot. And, you know, and, and truly, as you said, res resilience is something that you need to build, you know, okay, you've identified the problem. Now you have right. to, and I think identifying the problem is the, is the biggest thing. Like once you have identified the problem, then you just have to work towards it, right? So, so that's where resilience sort of comes in place. And, um, Everyone has their own coping mechanisms. Mine has been Sitar and, you know, with Sitar for mental health, I have tried to uh, generate their, their, this awareness that, you know, you can yeah. listen to this music. This has helped me try it out. You know, yeah. uh, I'm not, I'm not claiming to be a therapist or I'm, I'm not yeah. try, trying to heal you. I'm, uh, I'm just raising awareness and, you know, yeah. see if it helps you. If not, then, you know, there's, there's always uh, yeah. uh, other options. R Rishabh, actually, uh, you know, what I, I would, uh, We'd be all very happy if you could just share a minute of some beautiful music uh, on your sitar. Absolutely. And, absolutely. Um, just Anything so that, you would you know, like to hear? <laughs> no, your, your pick, whatever you find uh, okay. healing for the heart and mind. So this song is uh, called Tilaka Mod and it's, it was a tribute to my Guruji. And I released this on his uh, 101st birthday. And this is the first raga that he ever taught me and i oh, wow. wanted to you know sort of make that into a song and just in a in a, in a two minute memory and just put it out there in the world uh, and wow. share it with you know everyone so this one's called tilak kamod <laughs>
It's lovely. That's lovely, Rishabh. It's so beautiful. Very healing. It's beautiful. Music like this heals. There's no doubt about that. Yes, definitely. It has helped me. So I've been releasing music since then and uh, actively going around uh, different cities in India, in the US, and just you know, just playing for other people. It's lots of applause and appreciation from our audience. Understand? I mean, obviously, <laughs> beautiful, Rishabh. It. It's. Um, so nice to have you and uh, thank you so much for being part of this discussion for sharing thank your story you and much. your your talents and your wonderful music it's been absolutely beautiful uh, to have this uh, meeting and i think your you know your what you've shared i'm sure has helped a lot of people um, understand themselves and hopefully will allow them to seek help when it's when it's needed yeah we we can certainly hope so and i would just wanted to give a shout out to tll <laughs> they've been um my day ones you know they have been supporters of sitap mental health since um uh, almost a year now and i'm very grateful for that and and thank you for you know inviting me to the session i would love for you to come to the bangalore show and Absolutely. Uh, and please please join us and we would be so honored to have you and the work you're doing is uh, uh, i don't even have words for that no not at all i have the emotions i feel uh, i hope that the emotions are transmitted successfully mm -hmm. but i we really appreciate you doctor not at all i thank you very much and i really appreciate uh, what what you you know your presence today and what you're doing for mental health for music of course but also for mental health it's a real thank pleasure you. thank you so much rishab i'm looking forward i'm definitely going to be at your concert when you're in bangalore thank so you. thank, thank you, you so much that'll, that'll and, make me uh, happy <laughs> thank you so much so and um thank you everybody for joining us on this um topic decoding men's mental health brought to you by the live love love foundation uh you, we had uh, rishab Sh uh, sharma and i've been dr sham bhat um if you have any other questions please share your questions and we will uh, do our best to answer them we'll have other live sessions in the in our channel in the weeks and months to come so thanks again for joining us thank you rishab thank you everybody and thank you thank you we'll so much you have a great night guys thank you thank bye -bye. you see you bye